Terry, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted when I turned 17. Do you recall what the date was? Uh, I think June, around June 10th, 1945, two days out of high school. Now, you were 17. Did your parents have to sign to them? Yes. And they willingly did that? Uh, my mother was not very, very willing, but she did. Uh, where were you living at the time? Uh, Woodbridge, New Jersey. Why did you enlist? There was a war on. And you wanted to be part of it? I felt it was my duty. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Two reasons. I had a cousin who had just been killed on Peleliu, and I never considered joining any, any other branch of service unless it was one that would let me fly. And there, it was too late, and they were no longer in the war. They were no longer taking people to train as flyers. So you wanted to be a pilot when you enlisted? I would have liked to, have, but I, when I enlisted, I did not enlist. I enlisted to be an infantryman. Where were you inducted? Uh, New York City. Do you recall your first days in service? V vaguely, yes. What was that like and where did you go? Well, I went to Paradise Island, sometimes called Paris Island, South Carolina. And what else did you want to know? What What was that like? That was for your basic training? Yeah, that was for boot camp, Marine Corps boot camp. And that's the heat. Uh, how long was your training? I think uh, 13 weeks, if I remember right. But I don't know for sure. What was that like? It, it was not easy for a simple-minded, naive young boy. It was, it was a traumatic experience. Do you remember any memorable events or situations during your basic training? Nothing particularly memorable. Uh, I guess the one... We did hear, hear rumors of uh, so we're talking about your boot camp at Paris Island. Yeah, well, the only thing I really <coughs> remember is uh, the um, drill instructors who were doing their best to t turn us into Marines or at least to get us uh, toughened up enough so that we'd have a chance of surviving. Do you recall any specific drill instructors? I had two. I think Gunnery Sergeant Antonacci is the name that's always stayed with me, and Sergeant Pope. What were they like? Hmm? What? what were they like? Uh, Pope was uh, not your typical DI. He was a uh, very, uh, very human guy. Very interested in in anything that you wanted to talk about. Uh, Ananachi was older. He, I. He'd been in the Marine Corps before the war started, or before we got into the war. And so, I uh, was anxious to get out, but he, he, was not, he was not a very kind man. He was more, more what you'd expect a Marine, Marine DI to be. 
Where did you go after your basic training? Uh, Camp Pendleton. And how long did you stay there? Uh, I don't remember for sure, but uh, two or three months. What were your duties? And training. So it was more training? Did you, did you know what you were being trained for then? Were you being trained as an infantry man? Yeah. So you knew you'd be in the infantry when you went and if you went overseas? Yeah, that was definitely my, my inter, intent and desire. Where did you go after Camp Pendleton? Uh, the war ended, so I was out in Hawaii for a couple of years. Well, you stayed in the, the Marine Corps then, even after... I couldn't ended. get out. I'd enlisted for four years. Oh, so you were already committed. Mm -hmm. Do you recall where you were when you heard that the war was over? Uh, well, I was on Paris Island, and... Uh, When I, we were out on a on a march and a hike, and <coughs> a uh, I believe it was a, a woman marine uh, drove up to tell the uh, our drill instructor who was had leading us on this march that uh, the war was over that, that told us a little about the the atomic bomb and actually when we when we got the message i was sitting sitting on a set on a sand dune what was the reaction actually i was a mixture of Disappointment and relief. I was gl glad that I wasn't going to go get shot at. Uh, I was disappointed I didn't get a chance to be a Marine. Not in that war, anyway. Yeah. So you went from there to Pendleton and then to Hawaii? Yeah. So you were a couple years in Hawaii. What were your duties in Hawaii after the war? I hate to admit it. it was, to me, it was, it was totally disgraceful. I was a uh, gate guard, it's a, a gate guard on the Pearl Harbor main gate. And from there I went to, my father died when I was there, and, uh, but I've been, finally was able to get a transfer out of Pearl and I was out in Guam for, for about a year. What did you do on Guam? More guard duty. Now, you went to both Pearl Harbor and Guam after the war. Yeah. What was it like going to those places where there had been such battles and devastation in then Pearl where everything had been bombed? What was that like for you? Well, by the time I got there, things were very unwarlike. Uh, there was very little evidence of any uh, any damage from the Already? From, from oh yeah the, the, uh, I guess I I remember we used to go over to Hickam Field which was right next to Pearl Harbor and I know, I don't remember seeing any evidence of the bombing there, and there's none in the harbor. Wow. Where did you go after Guam? Uh, it's interesting. Actually, in between, for, from Pearl, I went to... Uh, uh, and we talk, and I was on the USS Curtis, which was a converted seaplane tender, and was um, 
had been converted into a laboratory ship for the uh, bomb to atom bomb tests and went to and we talk and uh, my duties was uh, again a security guard on on the laboratories on the ship and how long were you at any week uh I think we're there for probably at least two months uh where they shot off three bombs and so they were we, still experimenting with the atom bomb even after the war oh yeah the, and did you see the explosion yeah wow that was pretty historic <laughs> well it was uh it was impressive, as one word, I suppose. And then you went to Guam, and after your service on Guam, where did you go? Uh, came back and was stationed in Boston until the Charlestown Navy Yard, uh, until my enlistment was up. Do you recall the the date or approximate date you were discharged? Oh, my discharge date is on my discharge. I think it's June 10th, 1949. What did you do after that? I worked in the mines in Colorado for a while. How did you end up in Colorado? You well, that's... New Jersey. Well, we were only in, uh, in New Jersey as a temporary thing. My f father taken a, a job in New Jersey, and we I lived there for three years. I'm from born in Idaho originally, and uh, I've never never considered New Jersey home, although I still have some contacts there. Uh, Where in Colorado did you return to? Silverton. What kind of mines did you work in? Hard rock mines, lead, zinc, copper, silver, and gold. So that was from 1949 until when? Nineteen forty-nine until I got caught. But I don't know. We're missing something here because I went when I got out and I went back and went to work in the mines. And then when I When in the fall, I went down to Boulder and un enrolled at Colorado U. And uh, then I came, at the end of the year, I came back to Colorado, to Silverton, back in the mines. And then uh, June 25th, 19... 50 came along, and Harry Truman needed help, so he activated all Marine Reservists. All right, so you were in the Marine Reserves. Did, is that something that be, was automatic as part of your... Or? No, I had joined that when I got discharged the first time uh, because I, as I said before, I anticipated trouble with the Russians, and I didn't want to get risk being drafted into the Army. So you enlisted in the Marine Reserves. Yeah. You were still in the Marine Reserve. Did you have any training or any duties as a Marine Reserve? No, I got a, uh, I think every three months we got a little uh, mimeographed newsletter just to remind us that we were, <laughs> we were still on the hook. <laughs> When you enrolled at uh, Colorado University, uh, did you plan on going to, to college on the GI Bill? Yeah, I did. Did Did you have time to finish your college education? Not till I came back from Korea. Oh, so you got interrupted to go to the Korean War. So in June, you were activated. Yeah. Um, how did they notify you? 
Um, I think I got a letter in the mail. It said you're now on active duty. Report to yeah. where? Where did you uh, go? Camp Pendleton. Oh, so back to Camp Pendleton. And what did you do there? Retraining. The same things you've been doing yeah. before the first time. Again, were you going to be an infantryman? Yeah. How did you feel? Now we're in a new war, completely different set of circumstances. How did you feel about going to war this time? I felt pretty unhappy. Uh, not about going to war, but about President Truman, who had spent four years trying to have the Marine Corps abolished. Uh, and then Korea, Korea came along and he called us all back. So I guess he was probably glad he didn't have it abolished. Well, he and, uh, uh, who was chief, the Army, Army Chief of Staff, I uh, can't think of his name, but they spent four years trying to, to get the Marine Corps cut down to nothing. How long did you stay at Camp Pendleton training? Oh, two, three months. And then where did you go? Korea. So then you shipped over to Korea. How did you go? The way everybody did, on a boat. Do you recall what ship you went on? No, I don't. It was, it was an... <laughs> APA, I believe, but I don't remember the name. And where did you land in Korea? There's a, I don't remember the name of the village or town. It's on the, on the east coast of Korea. What base were you stationed at? I wasn't stationed at any base. We went up to uh, uh, up to an area behind the lines, uh, and got uh, dumped off at, and place to <laughs> find a place to. Lay down, lay a sleeping bag down, and sleep until morning when they woke us up and we went and had breakfast. And then got introduced to our platoon leader. Did you go over with an entire unit? No, I was a replacement draft. So you went as an individual? Yeah. What unit did they place you in? Uh, how company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. So you went all by yourself, you landed there? You no, were... not all by myself. There were a whole bunch of us. Uh, going as replacements, mm -hmm. but individuals? Yeah. So your whole group then got trucked up to this spot? You slept out yeah. on the ground? Mm -hmm. What? Where did you go to eat? What, did they have a mess hall or a tent or a... In the morning, yeah, when the light, when it got light, uh, they uh, rounded us up and took us up to where the mess tent was set up because it was a temporary setup for uh, the company that I went in, into, actually the battalion, um, to have uh, till they uh, were able to assimilate all of us uh, new new guys. What was your first impression on arriving in Korea? My first impression. Uh, excuse me. Was glad to be off the ship, <laughs> and uh, 
it hadn't started it hadn't started to get cold yet, so it wasn't too bad. Do you recall the date or the month and the year that you did arrive in Korea? Well, it was 1951, and I don't remember the month, but it would have been. Or was it summer? It, it was, I suppose, early fall. Once you got placed with your unit, what happened? But I, when I, I went over there as a uh, buck sergeant, and so I was, in, I don't know who, if there was any introduction or not, but I met the uh, fellows who were going to be in my squad. And Why were you already a buck sergeant? Because you had already been in and you had... I was when were you promoted? When I got discharged the first time, I was a corporal. Uh, when I got called back in uh, Camp Pendleton, and I guess there was a, the Marine Corps in its infinite wisdom, they, they were uh, short of sergeants, and they looked at the corporals who had good records and made them. I had I'd taken tests to, for sergeant earlier, but there were no uh, promotions available because they were, as I said, they were trying to squeeze them, squeeze the Marine Corps out of existence. And um, so I never, never got my third stripe the first time. We got one in Pendleton. And then when I was in, after I'd been on, uh, in Korea for a month or so, uh, we lost the, the two uh, two senior sorry two senior NCOs and I was the oldest or long in term of service uh, buck sergeant so they made me a platoon sergeant although I before I got the I did I did go back to uh, I remember now to uh, wherever the division headquarters were, and they had a staff NCO school set up, and we went to uh, classes in the tent, le lectures and tests, and uh, we had an effort to get us qualified to be staff at to ha have handled the extra responsibility of a staff of a platoon sergeant. Before you were promoted to be a platoon sergeant, you were in a, Korea. Or, I was a squad leader. You were a squad leader. Um, what what did you do for that month or two as that squad leader? Which squad did you command? I think I'd, my recollection is, and this is. Fuzzy, it might have. It was probably the uh, first squad in the in the in the first pl first platoon. There are three 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 rifle platoons in a company, and I was in the first platoon, and I took had. The first squad, there are three squads in a platoon. What were your responsibilities as a squad leader? It's hard, 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 
hard to uh, describe. I had to uh, make sure that everybody had their uh, weapons and distribute uh, grenades if we were going out on a patrol or something like that. Um, I don't really remember a lot. Things that, a lot of things I don't want to remember. But... Uh, How many men were in your squad? Uh, oh, on paper, uh, a Marine Rifle Squad is 13, 13 men. Three fire teams of four men each and, and a squad leader. We very seldom had a full uh, complement. So, um, as the squad leader, would you go out with, with a, a larger platoon and go out on missions every day? What did you... Uh, maybe not every day, but more likely, uh, uh, more often, almost every night, uh, you'd go out and either try and uh, set up an ambush or uh, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say attack, but uh, try and knock out a, an individual Korean bunker. They were dug in uh, pretty much the way we were. Were you right on the front lines then? Yeah. And you go and look for somebody to shoot at and try not to get shot at yourself. And then come back and sleep during the day? Come back and uh, sleep or we would go out and they kept take, taking us out in the snow to to run training exercises. So after you were in Korea for a month or two and they made you platoon, platoon, platoon um, leader, uh, was it a different platoon? Or was no, it, it was, was the platoon, the platoon that, that I was in. in. Yeah. So you actually knew some of the, the guys? I, I knew people. most of them. Oh. In fact, I, there were guys that I had known from my first, from Back four years or, or a few years earlier. World War II? Yeah. I remember one in particular with a uh, fell in the, in the mortar section. Each rifle company has a 60, mil, 60 millimeter mortar. I don't remember how many men on the mortar section, but I'd known him. I kept trying to get transferred back into the mortars because they were in the rear. And that's where he was located? Mm -hmm. Did you ever run into him though? Yeah, I would see him almost every day. Oh, oh, so you were, so he, okay. Um, as, as a platoon sergeant, how did your duties increase? Well, first of all, you have to be in charge of more men. So how many men are in a platoon? Uh, depends on the situation and the terrain, but nominally about 45, including the corpsman. So, just size-wise, your duties increased. Yeah. What new responsibilities were added? Oh, when the... Uh, we call it the goop train. The Korean laborers who uh, carried our supplies up to the line. Uh, my, I was responsible to make sure that the uh, rations and the grenades and ammunition got distributed out to the men in my platoon. So all of the squad leaders had to answer to you then? Yeah. How, 
how long did you stay on the front lines as a platoon sergeant? Well, we the longest we were on line, I think, was uh, 63 days before we got relieved. Uh, and then we're back. I guess the rest area, I call it, was called Camp Tripoli and was which was pretty cushy tents had uh, kerosene heaters in them. When we were on line, we had warming tents up in the on the reverse slope of the hills where we were dug in for you. Go. And one of the things I try to do is keep the guys out of the warming tents because, uh, or if they were there back to get occasionally warm up or write a letter, but uh, I didn't feel it was healthy to get too used to being warm. Because by then it must have been winter time. Mm -hmm. um, how long would you stay at Camp Tripoli in the rest area before oh, they'd send you back to the front lines? I think we were back there for a month. And then they'd send you back up yeah. to the front line, and then you'd stay another couple months there, and then. Mm -hmm. And how long did that go on? Till. Uh, pretty much till I got home, or till I got sent home when my my uh, my reserve enlistment expired. Of course, they extended everybody for a year, so I had to stay there for an extra year. But um, at the end of that that year, uh, they had to let me go. How long were you actually in Korea? A year and a half, maybe. I don't know for sure. While you were there, were you involved in combat? Yes. Do you recall any specific battles or incidents? No particular name battles, but uh, I can remember uh, several times when the uh, When by that time it was the Chinese, not the North Koreans. Uh, North Koreans were pretty well wiped out with, with the North Korean army. And so most of the opposition was Chinese. And they'd, they would hit us at, at night. Um, to, and one of the yeah, one of my jobs was to make sure somebody was uh, oh, up and awake in their uh, position. We were in two or three man foxholes. Uh, make somebody up, sure that somebody was up, and that because. On occasion, they uh, they would hit us, and if somebody was not, we'd lose a couple of men because everybody was asleep. And we were there was a position down in the valley that uh, the lowest. I used to, used to have a picture that a Polaroid shot, but I don't, don't think I have it anymore. 
uh, there was a uh, bunker built up that the Chinese were using, and we were sent down to to knock it out, and uh, that's the time I got shot. Uh, when we're on it, and uh, to me it was hip deep, hip deep snow. I have short legs, so that so that was great. And the only only thing I remember vividly about uh, that was the radio, young radio man who had just joined the company. Uh, was hit, and we spent half the day. Well, first the radio that put somebody brought it. Some guys came came down to join us with a stretcher, and it took took us several hours to to get this guy all carried back up to the to the lines where he could get treated and um, the one thing I remember his, his poor kid saying was he was glad he was with the Marines because he knew that they would get us out and get him out. Now that was before your, you yourself had been wounded. Uh, How did you get shot? I stopped running and laid down in a snow drift and I, since I wasn't running anymore I was an easy target. Where were you hip? In the hip. So did they have to get a stretcher then for you? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't gonna get sent back to the rear. So what'd you do? Keep fighting? Yeah. With your injury? Well, it wasn't that severe. And I guess I felt at the time that I needed needed the. Me needed the men as much as they needed me, or more than they need, needed them more than I than they needed me. So. So you stayed through the battle. When did you get your wound taken care of? In the afternoon, when, uh, when we were back up at, uh, at up, up in our war our positions where we were taken. Now, when you would go out on these kind of missions, like in this case, to take this bunker, would a corpsman... Oh, yeah, corpsman was... Almost always we'd have a corpsman with us. So when when the young radio man was hit, you had a corpsman there to look at it and after him until the stretchers came? Yeah. Did the corpsman take a look at you? He didn't even know I was hit until somebody told him. We were back on the line, and he they radioed for me to come back up to the CP, and uh, so he put a, a, it was a minor flesh wound. And he put a bandage on it. Do you recall any other combat incidents? Well, I remember. There was a, uh, where, where we were dug in, we're in a we were below a, uh, uh, a big rock formation, I guess we called it Luke the Gook's Castle. It was a, uh, where the, uh, Where the Chinese were had a a pretty st strong position to dig in, and we were supposed to go and knock that out, and they uh, first they told us that there was a um, would get an airstrike before it was time, and that sun set up. And but the airstrike never came. I guess uh, they decided that 
was too risky to, or were told that they were going to drop a, uh, use an Avenger TBF, uh, drop a 2,000 pound bomb on this position. Uh, but they called off that airstrike for some reason. So we went, uh, my platoon leader went off to the left flank, the left side of the hill, and I, I took the other half of the platoon to the right side of the hill. And I remember I lost my footing and in the loose shale rock on the fairly steep hillside there. And I, it seemed like a mile, but it was probably not more than a hundred yards or so. And I, before I could stop s sliding, and I, all the time I was sliding down there, I was holding on to a BAR and scared to death that I was going to get shot. <laughs> and but I finally got stopped sliding and I'm able to work my way back up. And uh, by the time I got back up, uh, one of the kids in my squad was, uh, I was still a squad leader at that time, one of the kids in my squad uh, had been hit and I bandaged him, his hand. He got a pretty nicely cut on his hand where the bullet, bullet had cut him. And I put a bandage on it to keep it clean while he got him, so was able to work his way back to, uh, to this, our company position where the corpsman took care of him because we didn't, ha didn't have a corpsman with the squad at the time. I guess we were down to one corpsman and uh, he was just staying in the CP where he, so he could go wherever, wherever he was needed. Harry, were you involved at the Chelsea Rifle of War? No. Had you heard about that? Did that take place while oh, you were yeah. there? Oh, uh, yeah. It took place shortly before I, I got there. I was, uh, the division had been chewed up pretty bad, and that's why uh, they uh, brought in a, a boatload of us replacements to fill up the gaps. And, but I certainly uh, read, read about it and, and heard about it at the time. Were there any casualties in your unit? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, well, in my... Were a platoon, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, we know you had at least one wounded man, uh, your radio man. Did you have any other injuries or deaths? Uh, yeah, two or three uh, wounded, but uh, I don't think while, I, while, I, while it was my platoon, I didn't think I, I didn't think, don't think I lost anybody. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Pur Purple Heart. <laughs> did you receive, how did you receive that? Was that for your injury? Yeah. When you were wounded? I didn't receive it until I was back in school. Back but, in the school in the United States? Yeah. Did you, why was that? They were pretty, they were pretty lackadaisical about, I mean, the Purple Heart is just, Really doesn't mean much. You get they pass them out in chow line, in a in a rifle company. Really? Not really, but that's what we used to say. You have a ceremony of some sort? No. My a few years ago, my son-in-law went down with me to a company reunion uh, at Quantico, and. He was, uh, John, my son-in-law, was, was really surprised that, at the number of Purple Hearts that people were wearing. 
I said, you're in a rifle company. You expect to uh, get at least one Purple Heart. You're not even a veteran unless you get at least one. Were you awarded any other medals or citations? Nothing significant. They were just the routine things like the combat action ribbon and the uh, good conduct. I had a good conduct medal the first time I was in. And I don't remember. I'd have to look up the board out there to see what I have. It was, As a platoon sergeant, Harry, were you responsible for any of the battle planning? or did Oh, that, no. That came down from higher up. Who did you report to? My platoon leader. So you would just carry out the orders and all the strategic planning yeah. that was made at a higher level? Yeah. I very seldom knew what we were doing or where we were going. I'm going to ask you some questions now about your living circumstances in your daily life. Um, while you were in Korea, how did you stay in touch with your family? Letters. So you were able to write letters and send them home. The mail got through up to the front lines, okay? Yeah. Now, when you went to Korea, were you already married or no? You were still single. Oh, no. So you were still a single man? Yeah. No, the Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife. They'd issue you one. What was the food like? And, what, and actually, what were the living situations like on the front lines? Obviously, you didn't have barracks to sleep in. We'd dig a hole. And, uh, and if we were there, going to be there for very long, we'd uh, cut some trees and... Uh, Build a bunker with sand, logs and sandbags. And then the, that hole was that hole in the ground was your was your house. So that foxhole was that even in the winter? Yeah. You stay in that all night long. Except when you were you, you would sleep in there, but uh, could, didn't want in there all night long. Somebody's gonna. Somebody's got to stay up. You just stand, ro rotate watches. When you were on watch or on duty, where would you go? In the f on the firing step of the, in the front of my bunker. You didn't go anywhere. You you stayed right there. Well, that must have been pretty uncomfortable, especially in the winter. Weren't you freezing? Well. well I didn't freeze. Yes, it was uncomfortable. It was cold. And but uh, I don't. I never felt it was as bad as the guys that had it who were up at the Chosen Reservoir. What was the food like? Sea rations. The entire time you had sea rations. You never got. Well, we were in when we were online. You got sea rations. Uh, I do remember one thing. The Lieutenant Livingston, my platoon leader, had gone back to uh, division headquarters to, for a physical, so he could. Uh, he wanted. He was a reserve officer, and he wanted to become a regular. So he went. He came back from the rear with a whole bag of onions, and distributed those among us. And I remember. Standing up and watching at night, and uh, grabbing one of these frozen onions out of the uh, snow and eating them, they were pretty good. Anything, there's so little fresh food over there that was safe to eat that uh, we really I did appreciate that. I learned that's where I learned to like onions. <laughs> what did the sea rations consist of? Well, the worst ones we call with meat and beans, meat and noodles, corned beef hash, pears, and PM. And if you get that box of rations for a day, you throw it away. <laughs> but uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, 
uh, individual ration cans were were pretty good. And uh, back when we we were at Camp Tripoli, we were fairly close to a dog face unit army, and the army was getting a rations, which were all of our stuff was left over from World War II, and. Uh, the army had developed the new A rations, and a couple of times we were able to uh, uh, liberate some of those A rations from the from your army friends. When you were at Camp Tripoli, did they did you have barracks with real beds that you could no, sleep in? No, I did have a tent with a kerosene heater. In them. So even at the rest area, it wasn't like luxury. Well, I, <laughs> I remember my mother commenting that when I sent her this picture of the uh, rest area, that somebody Polaroid picture somebody had taken, and says that doesn't look like a rest area to me. <laughs> In the tent, at least you had a tent and kerosene heaters. Did you sleep on the ground? Oh, you know, you we had big cots. And did you get three meals a day, three hot meals a day at the no. rest area? You'd get uh, two, two hot meals a day. Did you always have enough supplies, uh, ammunition, clothing, that kind of thing? We never ran out of ammo that I remember, uh, which was a good, good thing. And the only, sometimes we have we run a little low on rations when we're dug in there because the uh, uh, the goop train uh, couldn't make it up because of the weather. Did you feel pressure or stress? I didn't have those words back then. I, don't know, I, I still don't understand this post-traumatic stress disorder that everybody suffers from. Uh, of course, there's, I suppose that there's a difference if, if you got drafted. But well, these guys in Iraq, and they all enlisted, so they should know what they're getting into. And I I always felt sorry for the dog faces, the army, when we were over in Korea, because they, they had, most of them were draftees, and they didn't really have anything to fight for. We'd already uh, decided we were not going to win that war. Uh, it was going to be too, almost maybe have been impossible. But uh, by by 1952, uh, we knew we were apt to be there forever, and at least we had Marine Corps to fight for. The Army, I didn't feel, had any particular motivation for being there. Harry, did you do anything special for good luck? No, I don't think I did. I just figured what was going to happen was going to happen. What did you do to entertain yourselves when you were not up at the front lines? Write letters and read. Did you have a chance to travel anywhere else? No. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events?
or when that was kind of humorous. We were, when we were bit, we had been relieved off line. We were on our way to the rear, and the uh, we were we marched back, so we were out of artillery range, and they slept out on a field, and. We had set up shelter halves. That's the two man tent with everybody carries a shelter half and you can snap, snap them together and make sort of a, a tent. And since the weather was not too bad, uh, a lot of the guys didn't, uh, they just slept out, out in the open. And we woke up, and there's a foot of snow on the ground. <laughs> and I can't think of anything else that I thought of was humorous. Now you were in a rifle platoon. What um, what were you carrying for rifles at that time? M1. Was it the M1 oh. Garand? Although I would try and uh, borrow a BAR from uh, somebody who wasn't going out, uh, but most of the time I had an M1. What did you think of that weapon? They've never had a better one. What did you think of the officers? I thought the Lieutenant Livingston, who was my platoon leader, I really liked him. In fact, I looked him up uh, a few years ago. He lives out over in Rhode Island. Uh, the company commander nobody ever saw. <laughs> you mean he wasn't up in one of those foxholes? No. Or uh, and he was uh, he was not well regarded by the men. Do you recall his name? No. What did you think of your fellow officers at the sergeant uh, level? Uh, most of them, I thought, were probably better Marines than I was. Partly because they were bigger and stronger, and also since I was four years older than a lot of them, uh, maybe I was not as gung ho. What about your fellow Marines, the Marines that were with <coughs> I felt sorry for one kid. We had one one married man. One married kid in a, in my platoon, and I didn't think that was a good situation. Because I didn't think uh, I thought if, if the Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife, they'd issue you one. You were married to the Corps. Harry, did you keep a diary or a journal at all while you were? No, and I've often thought it's a shame that. Uh, My mother didn't uh, keep the letters that I wrote. Maybe I could have written something up, but uh, I have nothing nothing to fall back on there. Do you recall when you left Korea? Yeah. When was that? In the, what year was it I did? In 1953. Uh, Summer, winter. It was spring. So, Harry, where uh, you left Korea in the spring of 1953. Where were you at the time? 52. Oh, spring of 52? I think so, yeah. 
I think I, I was going to correct myself. I said, did say 53, but no, 52, I came home. Where were you when you heard you were going home? Uh, I think we were, we had, in, back in battalion reserve, uh, which was right behind the main line, the, uh, it wasn't wasn't a built up area. Uh, we just uh, had tents to sleep in back there, and they. I knew I was going to be going home pretty soon because my my enlistment was. The, the one-year extension on my enlistment was up, and they had let me go. Yeah. So did you return to the United States on a ship like you went over on? Not the same one. No. A similar... Did you have trip. a better trip coming back? Of course it was better coming back, <laughs> although I was looking forward to going over there when I went over, so it, it was a totally different emotion. How long did it take on the ship to get back home? Um, I think it, they had they couldn't go the Great Circle route because these apparently we were told there were bad, really bad storms in the Central Pacific, so it had to. Uh, took an extra two or three days because we couldn't come the short the short way. So probably two weeks. And where did you land? Uh, I think what the... Uh, went first to San Francisco and a number, I don't know what the reason was for breaking them up, but it's about half of us got off, off it's, half of the troops got off in San Francisco. Uh, and then we had to go back down to uh, Long Beach, where, which was a couple more day, another day on the, and we're, Went from there to Pendleton. Pendleton or San Diego? I think, no, we went to San, the San Diego Marine Base. How long did you stay there before you were discharged? Since I was fairly well down in the alphabet and it was going alphabetically, uh, I was a week at least. What did you do while you were there? Did you have military duties or could you just wait it out? Just waited it out. Do you recall your last day in service? The day I walked out of the gate at, at uh, San Diego. And, uh, I remember... I remember I had uh, ordered a suit, a civilian suit to wear when I got home and I uh, stopped by the store and they didn't have it altered so I had to wait while I finished the alteration. They, they didn't want to, I didn't, they weren't going to gamble that I was not going to come back and I didn't have the money until I got my because they only gave us, what, uh, $10, I think, because I remember, which I had to last me the whole week. And When you were discharged, did you return home to Colorado? Yeah. And what did you do in the days and the weeks right after your discharge? Look for a job. And did you find one? Yeah. Went back in the mines. 
Did you go back to college also? Uh, yes. I, uh, in the fall, I went back to, uh, went back down to Boulder. And did you go on to get your degree? Yeah. What was your degree in? Mechanical engineering. What did you do as a career later? Did you become a mechanical engineer? Well, I thought I was. <laughs> I, I guess I spent uh, five years uh, in design and uh, nuclear submarines, and then after that, I I quit that job and. Uh, I was in, in Pittsburgh there. It's where I met, no, met my wife and my children were born there. In Pittsburgh? Yeah. And I was dis did not more and more dislike working uh, on that job. Then I was able to get a job here in Connecticut. I came first to Hamilton Sanders and did some work on thermal design on uh, heat exchangers for the space program. And then I started bumping into people uh, whom I had known at, at Bettis in Pittsburgh uh, who were working for combustion engineering. And so I mo moved over there because it was uh, work I th thought I was better fit fitted to do, uh, although I have to admit that the, the year or so that I worked at Ham Standard, the work was probably the most fun I had as an engineer in you know, the whole career, but I didn't like the way they treated people. And so I came over to combustion engineering, and so that's how you got to Connecticut. Yeah. Now I know you uh, you married your wife at Pittsburgh, and how many children did you have? Three, three bratty kids. <laughs> did you make any close friendships while you were in the service, either during World War II or the Korean War? I had some pretty good friends. Uh, I'm trying to remember to, to going back to uh, my first enlistment. I had uh, a couple of very good friends the first uh, that first time around that, that I wrote uh, a couple times a year, kept in touch with. Uh, and one kid in particular uh, lived in Brooklyn. And when I was first working in oh, no. I didn't see him again until I was working in uh, here in Connecticut, and I had was down in New York on a business trip. And I looked him up, and then I saw him a couple of times after that. And, but uh, I don't think I've had been in touch with him for 20 years or more. Wow. And then I had a couple of pretty good friends that I was close to, close to uh, in when I was in Korea. And... I had, uh, again, I had lost touch with them until they had the dedication of the uh, Marine Corps or the Korean War Memorial there in Washington. And uh, 
I had planned on going going to that, uh, but um, Grace got very sick, so I didn't leave uh, at the time. But uh, a couple of the kids I'd, I'd known pretty well um, looked me up, and I got, and subsequently I started going to the a higher company uh, Marines that had a reunion every year, and I was going every year for as long as for, as long as I could travel, and and I got uh, uh, got a chance to reconnect with several of the kids that. Were, was was it going to say something about uh, when I I mentioned earlier that I'd gone over to Rhode Island to see my platoon leader, uh, and he we were talking about this one raid we were out on, and he says, uh, Mr. Liv Mr. Livingston, and he was a colonel when he got out of that. Marine Corps, but he was a second lieutenant in line of him. And he said, ask Bill, Bill Hanley, because he, he, Hanley was a big red-headed kid uh, in the platoon, and I guess he was, what, what I said, said, he was in the group that was on the left-hand side of the rock of the Gooch Castle there. and. He told, Livingston told me, ask Hanley if he remembered when we're out on that, uh, out on that raid. And uh, I told him that he gave, gave him a couple of grenades and says, give it the old college try. <laughs> and so I guess he did. And I, when I went to the next reunion, I asked Hanley if that was, if he remembered that, and he said, yeah. And one, one guy that I knew pretty well, that he, uh, he liked to talk about a time over there, and he didn't like Livingston. He says he, was going, he wanted a medal. He was gonna get us all killed so that he could get a medal. <laughs> I never felt that way about him, but when was the last reunion that you attended? Uh, the one that my, I guess it was about three years ago, when my son-in-law drove me down to Virginia. And I get, uh, I get frequent emails from a couple of the guys now. So you do still stay in touch with a few of them? Mm-hmm. Did you join any veterans organizations? My wife enrolled me in the American Legion. I had no, she thought they might be able to do me some good later on. And I never had any uh, I was go going to the meetings down here I think every I don't remember if it was every month or not but they regular meetings in town for the Legion and so I still uh, I'm a member I still pay my dues and the um, I joined the uh, the Marine Corps League And also the Purple Heart organization called, which I think is kind of a silly name, the Military Order of the Purple Heart. But uh, are you actively involved in any of these organizations now? Not now. I I'm pretty much uh, can't do much except uh, sit in the chair.
Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Uh, it made me uh, question the wisdom of uh, going to war unless you're prepared to, unless you're prepared to win, which we haven't done since World War II. Uh, I think that uh, what's been going on now in the last several years now over in, in the Middle East is pretty uh, pretty shameful. I guess if, if I'm I'm older and not that I I don't think that uh, most of our wars I guess maybe World War Two was necessary, but uh, uh, not since then has there been a war that I think I really supported even it, although I until it became obvious that we were not in not uh, going to finish the job in Korea uh, as I said before I, I wonder now if it ever could have been finished and maybe we were probably wise and declaring a victory and getting out how did your military service affect your life, Harry? Well, my wife used to tell me it warped, gave me a warped mentality. Uh, it made me feel, it's always made me feel a little uh, separate from, different from most of the people I've known and and uh, worked with because uh, and there's ex some of the experiences that you have you can relate to other people who have had similar experiences but um, you really can't. Uh, my wife uh, was uh, had been a nurse uh, with the VA. She'd been trained uh, out of high school. She, they had the uh, in World War Two, they had a uh, program where they would support you, support you know, nurse, nursing training, call it the Cadet Nurse Corps. And that's how she was able to get her uh, nurses training and her, her license. And she spent a good many years working in a VA hospital. So she knew a lot of veterans who were Uh, permanently injured, source, and so she, so she, I guess she was willing to to overlook my weird my weird behavior because uh, she had hadn't exposed her to uh, a lot of veterans before. Harry, is there anything else that you'd like to add or that we did not already cover in this interview? No, I think I... Only thing I would, would have wanted to say if it hadn't come up already in my uh, my unhappiness with... Although I think Harry Truman was a good president. Uh, I can never forgive him 
for his serious efforts to have the Marine Corps disbanded. And because the court has meant a lot to me. And let's see, I don't think I have anything else to say. Well, it's on record that you didn't think much of Harry Truman trying to abolish the Marine Corps. I'd like to thank you for your service and for your interview, Harry. Well, I wish I could have had more, had more exciting stories to tell you. <laughs> <laughs>